There's a passage in the canon where a nun comes out of the forest, having spent the day trying to meditate. And she sees an elephant, and the elephant has a trainer. The trainer says to the elephant, give me your foot. So the elephant takes his right foot and takes it over to the left, points the bottom of the foot up so the trainer can use that as a step up onto the elephant's neck. And she reflects, the nun reflects. Even animals can be trained. Why can't I train my mind? And with that thought, her mind became still. This is a theme you see throughout the canon. The Buddha talks about trained animals, trained horses, trained elephants, as images for what we're doing as we practice, especially as we're practicing concentration. A trained horse. It's well-bred, so it's beautiful, but it's also fast and strong. The strength comes with the right effort that's needed for concentration, and the speed represents your discernment. And you have to remember that we're trying to get the mind to settle down, and it requires some discernment in order to get it settled down right. Because you're trying to keep the mind in a certain limited range. Just the body sitting here, the breath coming in and going out, and trying to make sure that your thoughts don't go out and more than a few inches outside the skin. Otherwise you're trying to stay here with the energy body. And you're putting aside a lot of other thoughts. Sometimes the mind will rebel. Here again the Buddha uses the image of an elephant. You take the elephant out of the forest, you have to tie it to a stake. And the elephant, of course, is going to resist. So you do what you can in order to make the elephant happy to be there by the stake. You give it good food. In those days they would actually play the flute, sing to the elephant, try to get the elephant in the right mood. And then when the elephant would finally accept the food, that's when the trainer would know, okay, the elephant's going to survive, it's going to be able to learn the training. It's the same with the mind. When you can find a sense of pleasure with the breath, then you can train it. Try to forget about all the other pleasures you're not talking about, because as the Buddha said, when you're getting the mind in right concentration, you have to keep the mind secluded from sensuality. It just doesn't mean that you deny it pleasure. We have the pleasure here of sitting out in a quiet spot, the sound of the crickets in the background. That's pleasant. Sensuality means your thoughts, thinking about sensual pleasures, planning for sensual pleasures. Wanting to see sights like this, hear sounds like that. Taste flavors like this, thinking about the food you may want to eat. You're trying to put all those issues aside. That's off territory. Think about the Buddha's definition of right mindfulness, which is basically his instructions on how to get the mind into right concentration. You focus on the body in and of itself. And you put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Any thoughts about the world, what, what you want out of the world, or how you're upset about the state of the world right now, you've got to put those aside. And as he also says, you have to keep the mind in its proper territory, the body in and of itself. In other words, how you're experiencing the body directly right now. If your thoughts wander away into things outside. He says it's like a monkey wandering into an area where human beings have set traps. You're bound to get caught in the trap, so you stay here. 
Of course, the mind will want to find pleasure someplace. You can't deny it that. Buddha discovered that himself. He'd gone through six years of austerities, trying to deny himself every sort of pleasure, and realized that literally he was going to die if he kept that up. And then he thought of the time when he was younger, and he had spontaneously entered the first jhana with a sense of refreshment and a sense of pleasure that had nothing to do with sensuality at all. And something inside him said, okay, this is the path. It was only one factor out of the path, but it was the beginning of getting on the right path. So the grass and other food that you offer to the elephant, this is a sense of well-being that you get as you stay with the breath. So focus on what kind of breathing feels good right now. You can experiment with longer breathing, shorter breathing, faster, slower, heavier, lighter, deeper, more shallow. Try to see what rhythm and texture of the breathing feels good. And some places will tell you that a good rhythm to start out with is about five, six seconds in-breath, five, six seconds out-breath. Try that for a while, see how it, how it feels. And think of the breathing as a whole body process. When the Buddha talks about the breath, he doesn't list it as a tactile sensation. He lists it as one of the elements in the body, or one of the properties in the body itself. And these properties, he's saying, he says, can extend throughout the body. Like this, in this case, it's one part of the wind property, which is basically the energy flow in the body. And you think about it, okay, the air comes in and out, and there's a tactile sensation as the air passes into the nose, down into the lungs. But it's the energy flow in the body that allows the air to come in and go out. And that's what you want to focus on. You might ask yourself, when the impulse to breathe in starts, where does it start? And you may notice that it starts several places all at once. We'll choose any one of the spots that seems easiest to stay focused on. And then think of the energy flowing smoothly from that spot so there's no obstacle, nothing getting in the way. And try to notice where in the body you're especially sensitive to the flow of the energy. For some people it's right around the heart, other people it's in, near the stomach, some people it's in the throat. But there aren't, where it feels really good when you breathe in right, try to satisfy that part of the body. Because when that gets satisfied, you get more and more interested in the breath, because it really does go to the heart. It feels really good having a nice energy flow in that part of the body, because you're trying to get the mind to settle down. Just as you're trying to get that elephant to be happy to stay in the city where it can be trained. And here you are feeding it grass and water, so it'll be happy to stay here. There's another passage in the canon that points out there's an elephant trainer who came, came to see the Buddha one time, and he commented that elephants are plain enough. It doesn't take too many hours to figure out all the different ways in which an elephant might be tricky, but the human being he says, that's a tangle. Which is one of the reasons why it is so much more difficult to train the mind than it is to train an animal. But the basic principles are all the same. Give the mind something it likes so it'll stay here. Because it's when it's staying here that you can observe it. And observing it you can begin to do something about the problems it creates.
people have noticed something interesting about the way the Buddha organizes his teachings. He's got the Four Noble Truths, and one of the truths is the truth of the path, Eightfold Noble Path. But then you look at the Noble Eightfold Path, and one of the factors, one of the eight factors in the path is Four Noble Truths, under right view, which means that those two teachings contain each other. And the fact that they contain each other has a message. When you see the path as part of the Four Noble Truths, you realize, what it, you realize what it's for. It's for the sake of ending suffering. And it's meant to do that by attacking the cause. So as we get the mind into concentration, we're not here just to enjoy the, the grass and water. We're trying to get the mind to settle down so we can begin to see what is it doing that's causing suffering, particularly what kinds of cravings is it engaging in that lead to suffering, because it's the cravings that we're going to have to attack. You can't attack suffering straight on. You have to attack the problem at the cause. Otherwise, it's like having a boat that's full of water, and you just keep taking the water out, taking the water out, without fixing the leak. If you can find the leak, okay, then you can stop the leak, okay, then you can remove the remaining water. And there you are. The boat is fixed. Or like going into your house, seeing that it's full of smoke. If you just try to put out the smoke without finding the fire, you can get rid of smoke, get rid of smoke, get rid of, but it keeps on coming and coming and coming. You've got to find the cause. So we're getting the mind into concentration so that we can understand craving and abandon it. That's the lesson we learn by putting the Noble Eightfold Path in the context of the Four Noble Truths. But then we put the Four Noble Truths in the context of the Noble Eightfold Path. And that's to remind us that we study these truths, we learn about these truths, not for their own sake. They're supposed to serve a purpose. When they serve the purpose, then you can put it aside. The Buddha's images of taking a raft across the river. You're on this side of the river where he says, is You've got the dangers of your attachment to the aggregates, sense media, the way you identify things on this side of the river with yourself, and then they turn on you. There's the other side of the river where you're safe. There's no nirvana raft or nirvana yacht that's going to come over and pick you up. You have to make a raft out of things you can find on this side of the river. And you hold on to the raft as you go across. And then when you get to the other side, then you put it aside. It includes all the factors of the path, including right view. We're only going to be on right view to an actual experience where there is no suffering. That's where we're headed. But in the meantime, how are you going to get there? Right view is made up of perceptions thought fabrications. Right concentration is made up of all five of the aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, thought fabrication, and consciousness. But these are things eventually you're going to have to go beyond. You have to learn how to stop clinging to them, but you have to cling to them in the way that they get you across. So you're taking the ordinary, everyday functions of the mind where it has feelings, and has perceptions, the labels you put on things, thought constructs or thought fabrications where you put thoughts together, your consciousness which is aware of all these things. These are things that you're engaged in all day long. And you're trying to make something special out of them, make them a path, including all your views and resolves and all the activities of the mind. Think of them as a path taking you someplace, a raft taking you across the river. 
So when you hear people say it's, it's all about letting go, yes, it's about letting go, but there are certain things you've got to hold on to in order to let go properly. If you let go in the middle of the river, you get swept away. If you let go while you're still on this side of the river, you never get anywhere at all. So things you have to hold on to, knowing that someday when you get to the other side of the river, you put the raft aside. But for right now, you hold on to the breath, you hold on to your ability to get the mind into concentration. Because this is the only way to get across. This is why we train the mind to begin with. As Buddha said, the untrained mind is resistant. You try to get it to do the things you want it to do, and it'll do something else. But when you realize that you're causing yourself suffering, that's when you begin to be more willing, and the mind gets a little bit more pliant, so you can train it. And then as you get the mind deeper and deeper into concentration, you get more sensitive to what the mind is doing. Your standards for what counts as well-being, what counts as good food for the mind, you used to feed off of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. Now you're feeding off of the refreshment and pleasure, the right concentration. You're raising your standards for what you will take as food. And that makes the mind even more pliant, more amenable to training. Because after all, who's doing the training? The Buddha gives you instructions. He says, this is how you do it. But you've got to do it yourself. So you have to be willing both to be trained and to do the training. This is where it's different from training an elephant or training a horse. In those cases, there's the person who's the trainer and the animal that's being trained. They're separate beings. Here it's your same mind, doing the training and being trained, which can create difficulties, but it can be done. That's the whole message of the Buddhist teachings. We can train the mind to a point where it no longer creates any suffering. Other people have done this, and they're reliable people. You can tell yourself if they can do it, you can do it too.